And my time was running wild A million dead end streets And every time I thought I got it made It seemed the taste was not so sweet So I turned myself to face me But I've never caught a glimpse How the others must see the faker I'm much too fast to take that test Ch-ch-ch-change it Turn and face the strange Ch-ch-change it The one of the richer man Hi, this is Olivia Darbo, and welcome to Every Friday. I want to introduce my co-host. Who's that? Oh, me, Dan yes. Miles. Hi, okay. everybody. Okay, just thought I'd shake it up there a little bit. No, I like to mix up. Um, did you move my mic? Because it seems like it's at an angle. Anyway, you let me got move that back. bumped without your knowledge. I, did, I think I bumped it, actually. Yeah, and Tom waved yeah. at me to fix it, and I did right. the, as All a non-technical person, yeah, the I The juxtaposition has changed, and it suddenly really threw me off balance. Anyway, my topic today is the late, great David Bowie. Mm. Um, big love and adoration to this incredible man who will be terribly, terribly missed. And, you know, I can honestly say that in my lifetime thus far, there's been nobody that has, whose death has affected me to such hmm. uh, an immense degree, uh, 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 such as his. And and I think that there's many, many reasons personally that, that I can, uh, you know, understand why that is. But um, I, I just feel like as soon as he died... Or, you know, or le- left the planet. I, I have a kind of a theory on, on, on his death. I actually have a poem that I want to read by a, a, a writer called Tracy K. Smith. And it was beautifully, beautifully put by her in terms of why it, there's this sense of the, that he's not dead, that he's not gone, that he's still with, his, he's still with us, that he's still incredibly present um, in terms of what he's left behind in, in such a you know, how prolific he was in, in such a profound way. Um, first of all, I want to read something that I wrote to a friend of mine when he died. Um, you know, when somebody dies, you kind of mourn. It's one thing when it's a family member, but there's certain celebrities or there's certain people who have such a force, there's such a force to reckon with and, and what they've left you with um, artistically uh, and how they've influenced you, you feel like it's a family member. I mean, yeah. it's a very interesting thing. Um, when when people passed, uh, depending on how magnetic they are and how much they've contributed and how much they've touched you, um, and I just I guess I didn't re- realize with him um, how many levels that he touched me on, and I feel so honored to have been able to um, experience him in my lifetime. I mean, I didn't really become aware of him till I was in my teens, um, and incidentally. You know, I went to this David Bowie concert in the 80s. Um, I guess it's when he came out with the Let's Dance album and what yeah. have you. And the Go-Go's opened up for him. And uh-huh. then he came out in his purple suit. And he's like, let's dance, put mm-hmm. on your red shoes and dance. You know, it was that very theatrical with this great saxophone brass sound behind him. And I just thought, wow, this guy is so magnetic. And, you know, he moved so well in a suit and looked so well in a suit. And it wasn't until... Later on that I discovered Ziggy Stardust and all of that incredibly prolific stuff mm. and how he morphed into these characters, you know? And then, and, and then I then saw Man Who Fell to Earth that was done by Nick Rhodes and then realized what an incredible actor he also was. It was like there was nothing that he couldn't do. He, he had a couture sense of style. He was just enigmatic. And, and, and clearly, you know, to me, he really, he is like an alien. I mean, it was like he was from another world, yet embodied in a human form. He took the changeling thing further than anybody else I know. He was constantly changing. His appearance, his style of music is always changing. Yeah. So there was this thing that I wrote to a friend um, that I, I'm just like literally reading it from the text. Um, and what I wrote is, I think we've lost one of the most prolific artists that there ever was. And I'm sad that he won't be here to keep creating art while we're still alive. 
as it's so incredibly profound. He just covered so much territory in the world, the timeless traveler that he was. And in my life, such an influence as he inspired freedom and great otherworldly authenticity, rawness and truth. Maybe the aliens or ground control took him back home to spread his fairy dust elsewhere. Ziggy Stardust made the 70s, and even if Ziggy was one of the many channeled characters or souls that crossed over, it made history. David in all his glory is perhaps being divinely reincarnated as we speak, and yet another uh, reconfiguration to shoot back into our stratosphere through another star constellation. This I pray for, until then I will miss his presence and his deep, deep soul. You know, that's a, a great message, and you texted that? Yeah. Wow, I, I don't have the finger uh, oh, stamina I got, to I got write strong a message. Thumbs, Dan. You gotta stay with the group, baby. Check you know, some. my reaction to David Bowie's death was very interesting. It had never occurred to me that David Bowie could die. Hmm. It never occurred to me that he could not be here. I mean, it, that he was human. You know, it's weird. I don't feel that way about other people. When we mentioned Chris Farley and John Candy in the past, they didn't really look like they were healthy, you know. Or you, other people you expect to eventually age and die. Something about Bowie, it was just like... David Bowie can die? What? I mean, that was that was my weird first reaction to it. Absolutely. How does David Bowie die? How does I mean, that that, that's the thing. And, and the, there was this incredible poem, which I told you about by this writer called Tracy K. Smith, which I actually posted on Facebook because I thought it was so, so well put, you know? I mean, she was able to articulate in one poem the magnitude of, I think, universally what everybody felt about his death. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long, but check it out uh, for anybody who's listening. The writer is, again, called Tracy K. Smith. Um, I'll just read a little tidbit uh, that will probably uh, resonate with a lot of you. That someone was there squinting through the dust, saying nothing is lost, that everything lives on waiting only to be wanted back badly enough. Would you go then, even for a few nights, into that other life where you and the first she loved blind to the future once and happy? Would I put on a coat and return to the kitchen where my mother and father sit waiting, dinner keeping warm on the stove? Bowie will never die. Nothing will come for him in his sleep or changing through his veins, and he'll never grow old, just like the woman you lost who will always be dark-haired and flush-faced, running toward an electronic screen that clocks the minutes, the miles left to go, just like the life in which I'm forever a child looking out my window at the night sky, thinking one day I'll touch the world with bare hands, even if it burns. He leaves no tracks, slips past quick as a cat. That's Bowie for you, with the Pope of Pop coy as Christ. Like a play within a play, he's trademarked twice the hours. Anyway, so just getting back to that thing of how he could never die. I mean, I don't think he, it's like he's such an anomaly in that way. He just seems eternal. And I think that's a really well put way of why, because of the qualities that he exuded, not only in the public eye, but I think what he truly owned as an individual and a humanitarian and a person. I mean, he he went to great lengths to speak his mind about... I remember uh, in the 80s when... Um, I didn't actually see this in the 80s, but I was looking back on YouTube videos. He was like one of the first guys to really address that um, black people were not on MTV. He's like, look, this is a fundamental reason that we have music is for people like Louis Jordan, you know, mm -hmm. and the Harlem Renaissance, and this is what I've been influenced by, and yada, 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 and this is MTV. Why are you guys not playing black music? It makes no sense. And he, he was such a masterful technician in terms of how he was able to turn an interview around. Uh, I, I, I forget who the DJ was, but it was initially an interview with him, with one of his albums, and he took the time to actually not make it about him and make it about a cause or something that he really believed in that he was passionate about. And um, he ended up interviewing the guy who was yeah. supposed to be interviewing him. And it's if you can watch this YouTube video, you can download it. It's the David one with uh, Bowie. Mark Goodwin. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's the dude. He was giving Bowie the excuses and the reasons of him. I didn't know if it was he personally felt that way or he knew he'd lose his job if he didn't 
presented that way and it was, we're trying to kind of figure that he out he was but stuttering either way <laughs> either way you look at it what he was saying was total bs total bs yeah. and 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 even the way that, that bowie took it in mm-hmm. he didn't go for him in an aggressive way let's agree he to just, disagree he just kind of like let this mirror come up mm-hmm. and reflect what the guy was saying in a very classy way and mm-hmm. in, a, in a very uncriticizing way. And he just kind of gave that little wicked grin that he does with those beautiful, unperfect teeth that he had that <laughs> were sort of, you were wondering if he would ever possibly shave down one day, those brilliant English teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I don't know the scientific term for it, but he also has two different eye colors. Yeah. One of those subtle little things that just makes you realize he seems... A little bit different. Do you remember the what the first David Bowie song you heard was? You know, I think... I mean, because, you know, funnily enough, I didn't, as a kid, like him. I didn't get him. I thought he was a freak. Mm-hmm. My mother was an obsessed David Bowie, uh, mm-hmm. you know, follower. And, you know, funnily enough, years later, and this must have been about... This, this was the last tour that he did. She got tickets for us to both go and see him. Mm-hmm. And it was that tour and I just remember that outfit that he wore he looked kind of like a pirate he had like the vest and like the little cravat around like everything was perfect it was Mm -hmm. there was such synergy uh everything was so cohesively put together he was just such a perfectionist and um we were like two teenage girls at this concert holding Mm -hmm. hands singing all the lyrics so by that stage I'd overcome you know thinking he was a freak Mm -hmm. I was like a, a hardcore fan diehard fan as she was but my mom used to play, so I think it was probably a Ziggy Star. It was probably Ground Control to Major Ton was probably the first yeah. one that I heard. And I didn't really get it until mm-hmm. after the Let's Dance and all the Nile Rodgers yeah. albums that, uh, you know, the kind of more R&B, 80s big sound that he had then brought into his repertoire. Right. With, in my case, it might have been Fame. Um, I remember one of the first ones of his that I really liked was Golden Years. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also might have been uh, Space Oddity ground control to me i'm not sure exactly which of the very first one was but i remember he grabbed my attention with fame and golden years and it was in the 70s when i lived in Germany. you know it's funny as a kid when you listen to music if there's stuff that's too honest it freaks you out hmm. you need stuff that's a little bit more candy coated i think more poppy more sort of it, it needs to be a little gentler i think the thing about bowie is betw- betwixt and between his voice and his approach just to art it's so raw it's so bold it's so honest and i think that's why you know now that he's gone it's like you just feel like whoop it's it's like there's something gone there's something missing yeah Um, he was a trip unto himself i mean there wasn't like you know the bowie genre like you might have the hair metal genre or the jazz genre. it was like he was just his own thing yeah like there's not gonna be another bowie no never (laughs) Never, uh, but but you know, but what he's left behind, I think, influentially, you know, on so many different levels in terms of style and 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 just attitude and and just panache and Look the at- androgyny. That was the thing that yeah. freaked me out as a kid, yeah, which yeah. I so much more appreciated as I got older. Was how he played with his sexuality. It you know, he wasn't really one or the other. He was almost asexual, and mm-hmm. because of that. Uh, there was this magnetism that came out of him that was different. It was almost like uh, it's, it's its own thing, and I can't even think of really the word. I, I mean, authentic comes to mind, and the fact that he was anomaly, he was a one-of-a-kind, but, you know, he had the bone structure of Kate Moss. <laughs> yeah, when he was all makeuped up, he, he made a convincing sort of female. You know, and he... even in Lazarus, mm-hmm. um, sorry to interrupt, but, sure. uh, you know, I'm, I'm off on a tangent, mate. Do you know what I mean? Off and running. Help yourself. He's, Your he's, he's no video. Lazarus is so brilliant because he goes into even I mean you know you've got to reckon with the fact when you watch this video that the guy is clearly dying and he's still making this phenomenal art and he's he's taking the opportunity to go hey this is where I am right now you know I've got terminal liver cancer I've been survived I've been suffering for 18 months but I'm gonna make it through and finish this album and I'm going to talk about it my lyrics are going to reflect it and i'm going to play with that theme and make music and make it musical and i mean when he sees it as an opportunity yeah and he seizes it and he's and he went out with that bang with that message which is 
is such a huge thing to give to society. Mm -hmm. Whether you're an artist or not, it doesn't even matter. Just as a human being, like, you know, he had the opportunity to do what he did and he didn't miss a beat and he didn't waste any time. And till his very last breathing breath that he took, he was he he went out clearly um, bringing forth his his message. Um, now, in that video, he doesn't look, uh, you know, a model. He doesn't look young. He doesn't look, you know, he looks like a man who's dying. And when he puts on the dress and he plays around with his androgyny as, as a woman again, there's something so powerful about that, especially today with the transgender thing that we have going on. I mean, you think about how ahead of his time he was. He's he's just sending this message again through music that's that's even more powerful because he's allowing the music to deliver and speak. He's just displaying a love of life in death that most people never attain. And he's playing with kind of being female with that, which I think is really powerful. And it's like an unspoken thing because, again, it's through the music. He's not saying, this is what I'm trying to do. He's doing mm -hmm. it with his body language. He's doing it with his wardrobe. And he's doing it with how he um, conducts himself, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. that's coming out of him. That's nobody saying, hey, Bowie, could you, you know, David, could you just move more to the right? Yeah. It's literally all just coming effortlessly out of him so in a sense he's I get the sense in that video that he's being his own director and and that being said it, it's I think one of his most powerful pieces of art even even compared to Ziggy Stardust I think it's a, yet again he's channeling through something very deep and profound to yeah, the world it's powerful because you know like you said he knew in his mind he was dying and and he just said well I, what can I do without artistically you know he wasn't yeah. didn't shy away from me like embraced it we all die anyways and, yeah and it's just made but an he's artistic in a, statement but he's in like a Japanese tight fitting mm -hmm. excuse me it's not a moo moo but mm -hmm. what are those things called that the karaoke uh, or the I'm sorry the uh, those really beautiful tight shape shaped dresses. No, no, it's not a kimono, but it's like it's like the heightened uh, height of fashion that you mm -hmm. can wear as a Japanese woman. And so he's playing with this kind of, you know, Asian theme of 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 almost um, you know couture fashion, mm -hmm. and 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 he seems very female and effeminate in it. And so this emotion that he's exuding is coming through mm -hmm. in a dress in a very female way um not in a masculine way which i think is just a very interesting choice almost like a callback to earlier in his career almost yeah. like he, almost like you say your life flashes before your eyes and it's just like like recapping his different yeah thing as he knows it might be the last time you know? yeah well i mean i think evidently it it was and i think he knew that he knew he i mean like i don't know i'm merely speculating but i'm just going off of what I guess everybody is assuming when a doctor tells you, you know, mm -hmm. you have an internal disease and you have this amount of time and you have the prognosis, you have to think about what you want to do with that time. And he mm -hmm. was obviously very clearly uh, concise about what he wanted to do with that time. And he succeeded. I mean, the the musicianship in this album, it, it, do, it does. I feel like what's interesting about it is it's a combination of blues and tr jazz mm -hmm. fusion chords that almost don't go together they contrast but almost in a way that's it almost jars it's almost like oh is that really a chord and so it's very ballsy mm -hmm. um but yet it has the the fundamental foundation of a bowie album like it has the brass section one of the tracks that i'm going to play in a minute here is is called i'm dying to which is kind of a double entendre you can be taken as I'm dying to do this or I'm, I'm dying to show you another way or I'm literally dying mm. too. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it depended on how you want to, how the audience wants to interpret it. But um, uh, it, it, there's, there's, it's a dark album, but it's also very, it, there's a lightness to it too. I mean, it's, all, it's again, as Bowie always tends to do, it's theatrical it's um, it's it's like a musical at times, but always um, melodic, never atonal. Always melodic you know, and, and memorable. Because if you were to look just throughout his entire career, just look at a list of the musicians he's worked with. Yeah, you can see. I mean, anybody from Luther Vandross to I know, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, that he's just he's just like Luther Vandross, kind of like Frank Zappa. Background you know, singer. A lot of people come through Frank Zappa, you know, or your Vinnie Cayudas or whoever yeah. it is, and you know, it's kind of like a 
He's the same kind of guy. He's, and Stevie Ray Vaughan was a person he was connected to. But I'm just saying is that he was a student of music. He loved music. Uh, there are a lot of people, their vanity would prevent them from showing themselves in a video without looking their beautiful, you know, airbrushed best. He's kind of like, hey, look at me. I'm dying. Yeah. Look yeah. at this. Look what I'm doing now. Yeah. No real uh, ego about it. Did you see Man Who Fell to Earth in Nick Rhodes' film? I did. I saw it a long time ago. I recorded it off TV recently. I was going to rewatch it. I just didn't get it the time did to. Did you see him doing playing Tesla? I don't recall. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, remember the movie when he was a vampire, The Hunger. Yeah, yeah. Oh, with yeah. Catherine Deneuve and Susan, uh, yeah, Susan Sarandon. Yeah, that's the first time I saw him act. The famous lesbian scene. Lesbian. lesbian. When, when all of a sudden he reached his time. Oh, come on, get in the middle, David. You know you want to. Well, the opening <laughs> scene is they go pick up some people at a club and then come back and just gorge on I them. Know, right? turn out to be they vampires. They were thirsty, those vampires. But, you know, the two of them are, like, playing some chamber music because, like, they've been together for a couple hundred years. Then he reaches the point where he, he's in some doctor's waiting room and he, like, ages 40 years all at once. Yeah. Good actor. Well, yeah, just an all-rounder, but, I mean, <sighs> so highly gifted. Well, you know, a lot of people have reacted to his uh, passing the same way you did. Um, I know a lot of people... Uh, that were just like he was very special to them. Yeah, like was, I'm still devastated, mm-hmm. and I, I I just feel like somebody came in and sort of took mm-hmm. you know one of my kidneys. Well, of course, <laughs> the good news when any of these artists die mean? is all the art remains. Yeah. What you've lost is what they were going to do. I mean, yeah. to me, you know, Jimi Hendrix was such a loss because he was in his twenties. Imagine the music Jimi Hendrix would have come up with all these years. You know, so mm-hmm. there's a loss in that sense. But his big three albums are still there. But, 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 but see, the difference for me between Jimi Hendrix and David Bowie, and it's all subjective, and I think Hendrix is great, but he was high through so much of, you know what I mean? His, he was so young when he died. You know, mm-hmm. he probably would have gotten sober. And then, you know, but, you know, he was taking acid before he went out on stage and did a lot of those performances. And he was very free with his instrument. But Bowie was a visionary. Like, for me... It's almost like he was born and he had this entire plan about exactly what he was going to do with his life in such a meticulous way. Um, When I say, uh, you know, he didn't waste any time with his art, I I mean that very seriously. I mean, I feel like he was just kind of put here to do very specific things and leave a very specific mark, which he did. And I want to play this song called I'm Dying To because it's my favorite song. Um, It's not the Lazarus track, though. I love the Lazarus track and video. But the thing I love about this particular track is it pays homage, I feel, to changes. The beginning, it's got like a really cool kind of Bowie piano. It's very consistent with his very early work. And I think that he knew that making this album that um, p- people were really going to gravitate to. Hmm. It's almost like he put everything in that people really loved and will always remember him for. So check this one out. Nothing to me It's nothing 
as I listen to a track like that, I'm struck that there are several disciplines going on there. I mean, there's Bowie the lyricist. Yeah. There's Bowie the composer of these melodies we're talking about. There's Bowie the vocalist. Right. There's Bowie the performer. And it's like he excels at all of them and he's unique at all of them. And also, this is the other thing that's interesting to me is he was like 68, 69 years old. You listen to the guitars at the end of that. It's like you know, it's still like a, a young man's attitude. Yeah. It isn't like a creaky yeah. old recording. Oh it's my like... God, there's some stuff that is, I mean, you know, that, 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 that is the thing is he, you get a sense that his musical taste that is just, he's compelled by whatever is, he's an, he himself would have been inspired by just music that was alive. And I think it's, it's a musician's job. It's, you know, an artist of that caliber or any artist, it's your job to stay in, in the, in, in you know, stay present with, mm-hmm. with what is, what's current but what speaks to you currently rather than what's a fad i mean it's different Mm -hmm. than i'm not going to sit here and put down madonna but you know she makes many dance records and she will work with producerially which is smart by the way Mm -hmm. she keeps her stuff on the radio but it's about who uh, her choices are very much you know governed by who's the the next hottest dj but i I feel like he really there's some musical choices and you have to check out the album Mm. the stuff that's really youthful about it it's almost like wow he's throwing in like a heavy uh, you know he's throwing in like a synthesized guitar and synthesize program drums yeah. with a background with background drums and a proper real funky bass which is so simple and again i don't know how he continually pulls it off i mean he did a jazz album like five years ago um, this is what i mean people try different things but they don't succeed it seems like everything he but i think there's a reason he does it's because he studies up on it he knows yeah. if he's got it or not yeah you know? and you notice what you just said there's a reason he does see neither you or i believe he's dead and i'm sure yeah. that tom would feel the same way and speaking of tom it's tom at 
31 minutes. Is, is there really any point in doing the sound? No. Or, no. <laughs> we'll maybe, maybe we should hire David Lee Roth to do one. <laughs> uh, get on your friend there. See if he can do an impression. You're familiar with David Bowie? You've heard of this man? Have you heard of David Bowie? Um, <laughs> y- yes. David or, Jones. Or, or, or David Bowie, as I've heard his Bowie. name pronounced. Or David the, Bowie. Yeah, there was a whole big discussion yes. about that. Yeah. Um, he's buoyant. He's, he's floating <laughs> out there somewhere. Um, if you are ever sad, just remember that the world is 4.543 billion years old, and you somehow managed to exist at the same time as David Bowie. Tell it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a, a tweet that was, I think, wildly misattributed to Simon Pegg. Yeah. Uh, but it was actually uh, someone else uh, mm-hmm. that, that made the rounds during the uh, during the unpleasantness one. I read that. Uh, I and, love um, that. You know, it's funny. I um, I actually was not a big Bowie fan, uh, and when I say I wasn't a fan, you bastard! Yes, yes <laughs> I betrayed. I betrayed the tribe. Um, Speaking of honesty, cast him out. Honest by Olivia. Honest by Tom. <laughs> Heretic. You bloody bastard! No, I get it. What you're uh, saying, though. No, but... I, no when I, I say I'm not it. a fan, I mean I didn't buy all the records and I didn't go to all the concerts and I didn't, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean, obviously, there was there were a handful of songs of his I was a big fan of, and uh, like a lot of people, I respected him tremendously and i think the thing about his legacy is i think showing the potential of art and what i mean by that is several times and olivia specifically you've mentioned the idea that uh, you have brought up his authenticity his honesty and those are odd words to describe someone who spent most of their career obfuscating themselves and changing from persona to persona and never always having a slightly aloof manner. But what that does is it creates the conduit between him and his audience. There's, there, are, there are many ways to do it. It's not just about being straightforward. It's also about crafting the thing and people relate to the thing in any way they want to. Um, I, I've never seen, you know, at least in my social media circles, uh, I've never seen so much universal outpouring of emotion over, yeah. over an artist, over yeah. a celebrity. But I also saw a little bit of pushback from some folks who were saying, well, it's not like you knew the person, it, which is weird because it was coming from musicians and, and, yeah. and, and artists and people who should know better mm. that understand that that mm. conduit is so important. Art is so important to yeah. the human condition. And when people are, I mean, of course people didn't know him, but what they're mourning is the connection that they had through that art. And there won't be any more of that. Now, fortunately, as Dan said, there's so much of it in the world. He was so prolific. And the art, uh, as an artifact, as a piece of of its own uh, uh, material, it's important. But the idea of it is even more important. The example of it, the legacy of it. Uh, and also it had a chance to bring people into the fold who maybe didn't necessarily have a chance to appreciate him in life. And I know for some people that's the, the idea of people are being, you know, they're, they're, they're posers. They came late. They came late to the game or whatever. But that's why the art exists is to, is to stand the test of time and to invite people in. And I'm, I'm, I'm a great example of that, if I do say so myself. Um, I haven't talked about it on this show, but um, I've talked about it on several of the other podcasts I'm on. I'm in a group called Theme Music, which is a group of musicians who we record covers. Mm-hmm. Um, we get together and record covers. And we had Bowie Week a couple of weeks after uh, he passed away and I was recruited to play bass on four different songs, which I'd never played on before. Only a few of which I knew. Um, I did Lazarus. I did under pressure. This, the queen, the song he did with queen. I did uh, life on Mars. And I did this thing from very early in his career called love you till Tuesday. And it gave me a whole new appreciation to be able to get a window into what he was doing musically. I, I enjoyed so much learning those songs and learning how to play them. And I had this great experience where I was laying down the bass line to, uh, to under pressure, which is a song I, I adore anyway, cause I'm a big queen fan. And it got to that part in the bridge, um, the, where it starts to ramp up and Freddie goes for the really high note and, uh, insanity laughs under pressure. We're cracking. Oh, we give yeah. ourselves oh, one more chance. Know. And it was like, that hit me like it hadn't oh, hit me oh, in yeah. 20 years. Oh and God. I, and the tears welled up and I'm pull, laying down this track and I'm just exhilarated and I'm oh. crying and it's this whole thing and it's amazing. I get to the end of the song and it's like, yeah. And I look down and I hadn't hit record. 
Oh, <laughs> shoot. Don't. So, but, so I had to use another take. But the experience of that, you know, just being able to do that. And now, and now I am buying the records. And now I am checking well, it Well, I out. understand your yeah. point because I can imagine a person in their 20s and someone dies, whoever it is, and they go, oh. they see the outpouring. They see the respect. I better check into this. What is the fuss about this particular person? Plus, yeah. he, he, it was such a cool thing he did. I mean, for example, my first exposure to Lazarus was Michael C. Hall on the Colbert show or something because Michael C. Hall is doing the, the Bowie movie on Broadway in the show. And I heard him do the tune in his voice. I was surprised by how good he was. Yeah. And it's still, Bowie's presence still translated through it. Um, the, the songwriting style. And Michael C. Hall sounded kind of Bowie-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, so Lazarus that. is but a you know, heavy tune. What I'm yeah, wondering yeah, though is, do you think there's anybody, anybody who likes everything Bowie did? Because there's, you got to figure, you know, Rebel Rebel and you got to figure, because personally I liked Let's Dance was kind of cool. You know, China Girl was kind of cool. I didn't like Modern Love, you know. And certain of his, tunes of his I didn't. And certain ones I did because because there is that whole, you know, it's like the White Album. You know, some people like this but not that and this but not that. I mean, yeah. even himself, I wonder if he re- revisited it. In other words, because he kept changing it up all the time, some people probably jumped on when he was in the 80s MTV thing, didn't know about or didn't care about the earlier stuff. They just dug this. Other people thought, I don't like him anymore. He's a sellout. Look at him. And then he comes back around and back around and, you know. But think about the mm-hmm. diversity that he created musically for his audience. Uh, and because of that, you know, he had such a broad demographic. I mean, you guys are talking about yeah. like 20 year olds. I think 20 year olds right now, I mean, I can speak for my son personally, like, th- they they want stuff that's just that they can that's tangible where they go you know what I don't care if there's a, a you know an F sharp here that's a little bit off or mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying they they gravitate they just want stuff that they feel is in the moment and um I think because of that David Bowie appeals to a lot of really young people and I think that they will he did anyway prior to him just dying I mean my my son knew who David Bowie was but I think that. You know, if you think about even the music that's out there today that young people are playing, they, they've they been influenced by him. Mm-hmm. You can hear his, you know, melodies and, and his orchestration and stuff and his kind of just choices, like his mm-hmm. ballsy, just honest, bold choices that, that I think speak, speak to youth-orientated uh, audiences. But um, I think just getting back to his diversity, I think... Whether to me, I feel like I think it's a positive thing that an artist goes out and just tries lots of different stuff because they want to, because it they're all um, he just always seemed to be kind of ahead of the game mm-hmm. in terms of what he was seeking. And it always seemed intrinsically true to him, which whether you like all of his albums or not, I don't think it matters. I think I think it's that he that he just went for what the kind of music that he wanted to make and the kind of themes and different sounds that he was just interested because he wanted to stay excited about what he was doing and he wanted to continue to feel alive as a as an artist. And you're also talking about a long time period. I mean, he yeah. st- was in the 1960s that he started recording, certainly the early 70s, and he passed away in early 2016. Yeah. And he released a lot of stuff, so. Yeah. And also his influences, if you go back to like, if you listen to it, if you pick up an old Anthony Newley album, and you know, mm-hmm. on a clear day, mm-hmm. it's David Bowie. And you hear David Bowie talk about, you know, when he first, uh, the genesis of Ziggy Stardust, he was in a, you know, he was in Brixton in a, in a pub, playing in the same pub that, um, God, I'm trying to th- remember her name, some really famous English, Scylla, Scylla Black, or, mm-hmm. or was it, uh, I can't remember right now, but basically... He asked where the loo was, and they said, "You know, it's, it's down there, mate, in the in the in, you know the, in the metal-looking sink there. That's where you mm. take a piss, you know." Mm. <laughs> and you just went and mm. you know. So it's like to think that Ziggy Stardust, the genesis of that, started in a pub in Brixton somewhere. That's where he was trying this kind of character yeah. on for size musically to see if actually people in a pub would would take to it you know that's where he was trying his stuff out well he was brave because you know you talk about the androgyny and stuff i mean there's much less homophobia now strides have been made in recent years but back then i mean he and and later boy george to a degree too there was a certain male demographic that was just gonna be 
repelled by that, even if the music was good, because they didn't want to be associated with androgyny, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and he didn't seem to care. He just did it, you know, where other people would be drawn to it. I'm just saying is that he had an artistic bravery as well. But I mean, yeah, absolutely. And so were the, but but so were the... It was harder to do it then than it is now, is my point. So you're talking about him being ahead of the game and everything? Who else was doing? Who else was happy to look? I'm kind of male. I'm kind of female. Let's rock, you know. Because yeah. he writes band always rocked. I mean, Alice Cooper, you know, he also had kind of a thing. He called himself Alice, for example. But there was still a testosterone kind of style. But always an interesting character. It's it's interesting to look back on everything he did. But my point is, my first exposure to him was fame. Oh, funky song, yeah. golden years cool song. I mean, I respected him musically. I didn't hear his deep tracks or any. I just kind of heard his hits and thought he was good just as he was thrown into the mix. But you're talking about a guy who famously duetted with Bing Crosby. Did you mention uh, exa- Anthony Newley? That's the most classic I mean, piece of film, I think, that yeah. you can find. Yeah. Uh, because you've got you, the, 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 the separation of generations between those two guys mm-hmm. and how formal Bing Crosby was mm-hmm. or was considered to the likes of David Bowie. He was so malleable, and it's, it's wonderful to watch him in that particular clip because he's clearly, you know, very respectful of Bing Crosby and, and, and he's, he's so well behaved, you know, yeah. he's, he's such the English gentleman, you it's know. It's an odd pairing, you know, definitely different generations, but Bing's kind of like, oh, come on in. Yeah, come on in and then, yeah. <laughs> so we sing together. <laughs> exactly. I love that, <laughs> yeah. that video. I just yeah, think, think it's that. priceless. And the other one that was floating around, you mentioned the MTV one, was, you also mentioned Ricky Gervais on another episode, the whole Ricky Gervais, his character Andy Millman becomes, you know, kind of a celebrity, but kind of an embarrassing one. He's on a pretty terrible lowbrow show. He goes to this club. They seat him in the VIP section. He feels so proud. And they immediately tell him he has to get out because Bowie's here. Right. Oh, this is so humiliating. And then Bowie just turns around as a piano and whips up this song. And the interesting thing sort of behind the scenes is Ricky Gervais wrote the premise wrote the lyrics to the song, calling himself a pug nose. But Bowie wrote the music to those lyrics. Yeah. And that's why it's so Bowie-esque. And that's the one I was passing around. Yes. Remember the comedian Bowie. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. But, and you brought up uh, his turn as Tesla in The Prestige. Yeah, The Prestige. Um, which is, I mean, it's... <laughs> I can't think of a more perfect bit of stunt casting, right? I mean, <laughs> no, one yeah. enigma playing another. Right? Exactly. You guys just did a um, labyrinth, you know. The we did the, the nerds like us commentary on labyrinth, and that was a lot of fun. They had to do, they had to add an extra night to that because it sold out so quick. Mm. And absolute beginners too. Mm. I remember that. I, love I forgot that about song. that. And Sade in that, or somebody like that. Um, yeah, I remember seeing that and seeing him briefly in it. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to actually take us out with one of the covers. Please. Uh, that we did. Um, this is a, a, a quick little tune. It's Olivia's show. Ask for her permission. She's been mad at you once tonight. <laughs> I have. About Remember? What? He said, I'm, I was really into Bowie. Damn you, wanker. Oh, no. I forgot oh, about maybe, that oh, already. Well, maybe I can get my cred back here. Yeah, uh, get your cred let's, back. Let's see is, what you got, darling. This was recorded by uh, uh, Tim King. Is uh, I, I played the bass on this, and Tim King did everything else. Awesome. So this is Tim King channeling David Bowie, channeling Anthony Newley. <laughs> Love on a very it. early cut called Love You Till Tuesday. Can't wait to hear it. Just look through your window. Look who sits outside. Little me is waiting. Standing through the night. When you walk out through your door, I'll wave my flag and shout. Ah, beautiful baby, my burning desire started on Sunday. Give me your heart and I'll love you till Tuesday. Da 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 da, da 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 da, da 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 da, da 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 da. Hiding in the apple tree Clinging to a branch Don't be afraid, it's only me Hoping for a little romance If you lie beneath my shade I'll keep you nice and cool Ah, beautiful baby I was very lonely till I met you on Sunday My passion's never ending And I love you till Tuesday 
Tim live? Did you do that over the internet or? Yes, we did. Yeah. Wow, that keyboard sound was the Arp Odyssey imitation. Very cool. That, the, the one that the, the, the strings of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you, you you go to war with the army you have. So it was kind of like a, 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 a whimsical Sid Barrettie quality to that song. Too. Oh yeah, Sid totally. Barrett. Yeah, kind of remember. Totally. Um, oh God, that's another topic. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't th- get me started. We, Maybe not tonight. We but, need uh, fi- <laughs> we need fifty two of those a year, so yeah. we can dust him off. Um, yeah, I've, <laughs> I'm not going to, uh, I probably shouldn't even say, but I collect mashups because we're trying to use mashups. I came across a mashup. It's David Bowie's Let's Dance with Genesis's I Can't Dance. Oh, and uh, I've only just listened nice to it song. once, so I don't know if it's worthy to drop into the end of this because I just, I just uh, you know, um, previewed a little bit of it and then moved on to the next one. But maybe we'll save it for another time. Which makes me regret bringing it up because now people are curious right. to hear it. That's all right. That's all right. One must now, do as they Mr. feel. Now, Mr. Bowie has inspired us. I think this is going to be our longest show in history. Yeah. We've, we've tipped over 51 minutes, well, and that's fine. Well, thank you guys so much for staying with us, but it was well worth the uh, one's attention span, I think, and uh, hopefully you're all still with, with us. In the history of my show, when Ronnie Matros died, I felt compelled to do a tribute to him, and when Chris Squire died... I felt compelled to do a tribute to him uh, because both of them had been, you know, influential on me. But the way artists have been dropping this last month or so, I mean, when B.B. King died, yeah. it was mentioned. But, you know, and Bowie and all the different people. That Alan just, Rickman. Yeah, it's just like uh, the first month Glenn of this Fry. year. Mm. Yeah, Lemmy. Exactly, Glenn. A- Lemmy, any of them are, are des- deserving of a tribute, but I have been doing nothing but tributes in January. So, yeah. uh, But I feel like we did one today. Yeah. Now, God bless his soul or whatever planet he's fled to. David Bowie, 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 David Jones. Ziggy actually. the star <laughs> man is what I like to call him. Well, thanks for bringing up your uh, theme music because I know that's unique. No other Bowie tribute had that on it. So. Yeah. Cool. So we'll love you and leave you and see you next time. Uh, well said. Uh, R.I.P. David Bowie and we'll see you next week. Ground control to Major Tom Ground control to Major Tom Take your protein pills and put your helmet on Ground control to Major Tom Commencing countdown engines on Two. Check ignition and may God's love be with you This is ground control to Major Tom Now it's time to 
Fat man who sold his soul, the little little fat man who sold his dream. Chubby little loser. Chubby little loser. National joke. No, not not chubby little loser. No. <laughs> Pathetic little fat man. No one's bloody laughing. The clown that no one laughs at, they all just wish he'd die. He's so depressed at being useless, the fat man takes his own life. No, no. He's so depressed at being hated, fatty takes his own life. Fatty, fatso, fatty. fatso, I like that. Yeah, let's go with fatso. Fatso takes his own life, he blows his bloated face off. No. He blows his stupid brains out. But the twat I'd probably miss. Yes, Linda, I like that. Yeah, so do I. It's brilliant, Linda. He sold his soul for a shot at fame. Cat's phrase and wig and the jokes are lame. He's got no style. He's got no grace. He's banal and facile. He's a fat waste of space. Yeah, yeah. Everybody sing that last line. One, two, three. He's banal and facile. He's a fat waste of space. See? 